Okay, so today I'm going to talk about, as you probably know, how to import from China. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple different things. I'm going to talk about trends in importing right now, things to keep an eye out for, uh, just kind of where product development is going right now, um, some of the more macro level stuff. And then at the same time, I'm going to cover some more of the basics about importing, whether um, you're an experienced importer or somebody who's never imported from China before. I'll give you a rundown of uh, uh, some good tips and tricks that you can use when you are sourcing either your first products or uh, products that you've developed and had going for a long time. Okay, so what to look for in products in 2018. So the big thing that you want to know is that private labeling as it used to be kind of known from three or four years ago is more or less dead right now. Uh, back when I first started, you could basically take a product, slap your name on it, uh, put it online and you could sell a bunch of them. Now, right now that's more or less dead. And a lot of people look back to the good old days when you could just take a product and slap it online and it would sell and you didn't have to do anything to it. And they think of those as the good old days. Uh, but they weren't actually the good old days because what's happened is that product development's gotten harder, but actually importing has gotten easier. So back when I first started, there were not these services to get your products from China super easy. Uh, Amazon FBA didn't really exist in its current form until about 2012, 2013. Uh, the number of freight forwarders who are familiar with shipping small orders from China, either to FBA or to your own 3PL, those didn't exist. 3PLs, they were kind of a fringe thing. Now it seems like every city has dozens and dozens of third-party logistics providers. Uh, and FBA, of course, has made things so much easier just from a shipping and logistics standpoint. Uh, when I first started importing, I was importing these boat anchors, and I actually had to load them up in my Chevrolet Cavalier and take them to the post office. Uh, now, I haven't shipped a product in years simply because of Amazon FBA. So what's happened is that it takes more effort nowadays on the product development and it takes a lot less effort on the actual selling and the shipping and logistics component of things. So like I talked about, you need to be thinking about ways to differentiate your products now if you want to succeed. The good news is, is that there's still kind of this little section of time that we're in right now where you don't have to do a lot of differentiation to products to get them to succeed. Um, sure, you can reinvent the, the mouse trap and make a completely new and improved mouse catching device, but you don't really need to do that. You can do, you can actually just change products in some slightly different ways and you're going to probably find a lot of success. So I'm just going to run down a few of the different ways that you can change a product really easily. Um, you can make a product in a different color. I'm just going to move the, uh, the mic closer to me. Um, you, can make the, you can make the product in a different color. So if you have this cup, you can make it in blue. What's going to happen is that most people are going after the most popular colors of any product. So most people are trying to offer this cup in white. You simply make it in blue and yellow or whatever color it is that people are looking for. And you're going to get a little bit more of that long tail search term on predominantly Amazon. Uh, the same thing goes for different sizes. You can make you can make this cup in a different size. You say, hey, you say to your supplier, hey, can you make it half an inch bigger on the rim? Uh, what's going to happen is that your supplier can do that very easily. They can't necessarily put another handle on this product and make it uh, with a rubberized sole. That's going to require a lot of different molds and it's going to have a high fixed cost, but they can normally change the size of an item uh, very cheaply and on a pretty small MOQ. The other thing you can do, you can ask them to make it in a different material. So you can say, hey, I don't want this in porcelain, I want it in a melamine. And because they're normally going to be using the same mold for things, it doesn't require you opening up a new product mold, which normally costs around $2,500, uh, all the way up to around $10,000. Uh, they can simply make it out of di a different material and it's not going to cost you a lot more money. And what's going to happen is that again, you have a little bit of a differentiation when you're selling it on Amazon. You just need to be different. You don't need to necessarily be a lot better. You just need to be different. Um, the next thing you can do, you can dramatically improve the product packaging. Um, this is kind of going back to private labeling 1.0, where you could simply uh, just slap your name and logo on a product package, and hey, that's uh, good enough to sell. Nowadays, that's not good enough uh, to sell, but if you do improve the packaging 
And instead of packaging this in a poly bag and you put it in a nice box, what happens is somebody opens that package when they get it from Amazon, they go, wow, this package is fantastic. It must be a great product. Their first impression is that this is a great product. That's likely to be their lasting impression. And they're more likely to leave you good reviews, which is of course going to help, help you in the long run with your organic rankings. Now the next two things uh, in terms of differentiating your products, uh, these are my two favorite things to do. It's bundling an item with different accessories and it's packaging something in a multi-pack uh, package. So if you bundle it, everybody wants a cup, but everybody also needs a coaster for, for this cup. Now, when you're selling things uh, in e-commerce, shipping is a huge cost of your cost equation. And, sorry, this gotta close this window here. And when it comes to shipping, as we all know, there's a high fixed cost associated with it. So the flat cost to ship this product is probably around $4 at a minimum. Now, if I bundle a coaster with this, it's not going to really add much into the actual product cost, but uh, it's going to have high perceived value for the customer. So those coasters are maybe five to $10 uh, to actually purchase as a consumer. Maybe they cost you a dollar to actually buy. It's not going to cost you anything extra in shipping costs. So the customer gets a five to $10 perceived value increase. It only costs you about a dollar extra. Um, so what's going to happen is they're going to buy your item that includes the coasters with it instead of uh, the other guy who doesn't have the coaster. And you can do this with pretty much any product. Um, the easiest way to do it, go on Amazon, go into a competitor's web, uh, competitor's product listing, look at the also bought with section of the Amazon detail page around the middle of the page. And you can see what other items people are buying with that particular item. Uh, hopefully though, you know your item and your niche well enough where you kind of intuitively know what other items people are going to buy with this main product that you have. And then you can just naturally bundle them together. Now, where do you get those other items? You can simply ask your supplier, hey, I need, I want some coasters to package with this cup and they'll just source them for you. They'll take a minimal, uh, minimal upcharge from that. Or you can just go to Alibaba or AliExpress, find those coasters on your own, have them shipped to your supplier's factory and they'll be happy to package them uh, together for free. And the other thing, like I mentioned, uh, multi-packing an item, everybody if you go on Amazon is selling one cup. Now all of a sudden you put two cups together, people, most people need two cups. You package them together, you're not going to have a high increase of shipping costs. You'll have very minimal increase in shipping costs. You probably get some economies of scale in also buying more items and shipping them together and packaging them together. So what happens is that again, the customer gets a high perceived value, doesn't cost you a lot more in cost, and you're going to win that customer sale more often than not. Okay, so some trends and products that are working on Amazon right now. Like I talked about lightly differentiated products, just slightly improving a product uh, is more often than not good enough to succeed on Amazon. Some other things to look for though with Amazon, lower demand items. Uh, we talk to a lot of people at Ecom Crew, whether it's in the comments or members that have joined Ecom Crew Premium. Everyone's always looking for these really home run products that are doing tens of thousands of dollars a month in revenue. Uh, I don't know why people always want to go after those items because even now with Amazon, Amazon's kind of monopolizing e-commerce. A low demand item on Amazon, I, I kind of put my threshold at $10,000 in revenue as being a hit product. And these are relatively low demand items on Amazon that don't have a lot of competition. So that's what I'm kind of looking for when I'm looking for products on Amazon. I'm looking for something I can sell $10,000 a month of. That's roughly $100,000 a year. But what I can do is I can then source 10 to 20 of these $10,000 a month products. And before you know it, you have a company doing a million dollars in revenue. So that's the easiest thing to do. Just look for the slightly lower demand items. The next kind of trend right now, especially with Amazon products, is oversized items. Everybody wants to ship these small and light items that you can put in a box and air freight from China over to FBA without having to worry about sea logistics and um, all these other complicated logistics, there's still a huge opportunity right now for oversized items. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Amazon is in really, really good at handling these odd sized items. Uh, some of you might know, I worked at an Amazon FBA warehouse for about a week uh, last year. And it was amazing work, 
working out this warehouse, the different items that people were shipping in, third-party sellers were shipping into Amazon. So a couple ones that stuck out for me, uh, kayaks, not in a box, this giant, massive kayak, not in a box, not in a poly bag, nothing. It just had one little small barcode sticker on it. Uh, Amazon was shipping them out. Mattresses, uh, bed mattresses, not just these roll-up ones that go nicely into a poly bag, um, a huge full mattress and box spring people were shipping these. Uh, so you can ship anything in Amazon. They're going to figure out a way to do it. Take advantage of that. Don't just go after these small and light items. You can ship pretty much anything into Amazon and there's a lot less competition for these oversized items. And finally, next thing is high priced items. Again, everybody's going after these really low priced items, these $10, $20 items, uh, sometimes even less than that. The main reason why people are going after these items is because normally they have a very small cost of goods sold. So if you're trying to sell um, a little widget spinner, maybe they cost 10 cents each, you can order 500 of them for 50 bucks. High price items, so they require a little bit more cash flow to buy those items, but there again, there's a lot less competition for them. So I just, there's a table here on the right. This is not complicated math for anybody, but it's a point worth reiterating. If you're selling an item for $9.99, you need to sell 1,000 of them a month to get to $10,000. If you're selling them for $99.99, you only need to sell 100 of them to get to $10,000 a month. Less orders is almost always a good thing. Less orders means less problems with customers. I'd much rather have 100 orders doing $10,000 a month than 1,000 orders. 1,000 orders means 1,000 customers, 1,000 potential people who can just complain about any multitude of problems, just being nitpicky. Uh, your return rate is going to go higher. Just your touch, your customer touch points is going to be incrementally higher the more items that you sell. So if you can, go for higher ticket items. You're going to accomplish the same thing. You're going to get higher revenue uh, from selling less, a less number of items. The other thing to think about too is that when you go after these lower demand items, everybody's going after things that are selling a lot of units a month, and they're not thinking about the revenue figure, uh, but these things that are selling less units a month generally have higher profit margins. That's really what matters at the end of the day. It's not units per month. It's not revenue per month. It's how much money are you actually putting in your pocket at the end of the month. So just kind of going over this point, uh, just real quickly here, garlic press, everybody's favorite e-commerce example. So using my favorite Amazon FBA sales calculator tool. It's the AMZ Chrome extension. There's a link here. We'll send out the, the slides after the presentation here. But if you Google AMZ Chrome FBA calculator, uh, it's a great little free tool and it'll estimate sales for you pretty reliably. Uh, so this garlic press sells for 12 bucks, 670 units a month. Everyone goes, yeah, 670 units a month. That's fantastic. But it's 670 units a month is only about $6,000 in revenue. Um, if you just skip ahead here, once you actually add into product costs, and this garlic press costs about $4.50, once you factor in all the FBA fees and the product costs, you're only making 2,000 bucks a month in profit by selling this garlic press. Now this little calculation here, that's not taken into account marketing and advertising fees. And with Amazon PPC now being such an important component of selling on Amazon, uh, that $2,000 that you see here in profit is probably more like $1,000. Doesn't take into account returns. Most people are averaging around two to 5% in returns. More often than not, you simply have to dispose of those returns because they're not sellable. You'd be lucky to make a thousand bucks a month off selling this garlic press doing 670 units a month point is don't get caught up in how many units a month things are selling. Look at the revenue and ultimately look at the profit. Okay. I'm talking about a couple of the trends in China right now. Everybody seems to be afraid of Chinese Amazon sellers. Um, yes. Competition from China is increasing. Estimates about the number of Chinese sellers right now range from 10 to 25% of all third party sellers are based in China. Now, I would say that number is probably closer to the high end. It's probably is closer to around 25% of all third party sellers right now are based in China. The misconception that people have though, is that the competition from China is the Chinese factories themselves. And so what 
non-Chinese sellers think is that, oh God, how can I comp compete against these Chinese factories? They're going to have cost advantages that I can never compete with. Uh, obviously they're going to have lower costs because they're the ones making the product. But this is almost 100% wrong. The competition from China is not from factories. Factories in China hate selling on Amazon for a couple of reasons. Number one, cash flow. Chinese factories are used to getting paid for items before they actually produce them. So they're not used to this whole idea of produce some items and then 90 days later uh, get paid from Amazon customers. They do not like that. They don't want to piss off their existing uh, sales channels. And they also don't know simply how to sell on Amazon. These are factories. They're not, they're not internet marketers. So they don't really get this whole Amazon thing. The competition from China is people like you and me, except they're sitting in their basements or their offices in Shenzhen instead of Vancouver or San Diego. And so the point that I'm trying to get at here is that their only advantage, these Chinese sellers over us, is that they have a little bit more ambition than us. They're working six days a week, 12 hours, 12 hours a day, trying to hustle and get ahead. They do not have cost advantages though on a product. Um, it, it, I have a Chinese wife and I will not let her negotiate when we go to, <laughs> when we go to some of these markets in China, when I want to buy a new sweater or something, because she's a terrible negotiator. I almost always get a lower price than she does. Um, whether it's simply because I have a white face or I'm just a little bit better at negotiating. Uh, Chinese people though, don't just get naturally lower prices because they're Chinese. All right. We're not going to get through an entire presentation without talking about everybody's best old buddy, Trump. And you might've heard that Trump is getting pretty harsh on China right now with tariffs. So when you think, when you hear about these tariffs, what you want to know is that there's basically four lists, uh, that's involved with these tariffs. So list one, two, and three, basically they've been, they've put in, been put into place right now. They cover almost half of all products right now being imported from China. Works out to roughly $250 billion. There's a list four though, which Trump has alluded to. It's probably a matter of when, not if. Uh, list four will impact the other remaining half of all products. So right now, half of all products from import from China have been slapped with a 10%, 10 to 25% additional tariff. And list four hasn't taken effect yet, but that'll affect all the other products. Uh, probably if China and America don't figure out this whole trade spat that they have going on, uh, probably in the next few months. Uh, right now, list one, two, and three, the stuff that's already been tariffed, this does not affect consumer products for the most part. Uh, it's mostly affecting industrial products, medical products. Uh, Trump and his administration have fairly diligently tried not to target consumer products for the fact that once your cost of a TV goes up, you're probably going to bitch and scream a little bit louder than if uh, an aircraft engine goes up in cost. Uh, but it's going to happen less for. Now, what does that mean? Should you now all of a sudden be thinking about not importing from China? Well, the truth of it is these tariffs uh, aren't really affecting importers for a couple of reasons. First off, the price, these cost increases are ultimately going to sift through to consumers, not through the importers. Uh, what's going to happen? We're just all going to naturally rise prices or raise prices. Now, in the short term, if you're like me, I've had a couple products tariffed. Uh, I haven't really increased my prices just because I want to kind of wait for things to shake out here. Uh, I want to see what happens. I don't want to uh, quickly get ahead of myself and start increasing prices before I know whether these tariffs are going to disappear tomorrow or not. Now, with that being said though, a 10% increase in tariff is not really that big of a deal. Uh, so consider your average product, a flashlight that you sell for 30 bucks. I have a general rule of thumb when you're importing from China, about a third of your revenue, you're going to pay the a third of that revenue for your cost of goods sold. So the actual product cost, so on a $30 selling item like this flashlight, you're going to pay about $10 for the actual flashlight. You're going to pay about $10 in advertising and selling costs. And then you're going to have about $10 left that you put in your pocket. Well, a 10% additional increase on a $30 flashlight like this is going to mean that you're paying an extra dollar in tariffs. Sure, that sucks. That's a dollar in the short run that's being taken out of my pocket or being taken out of a consumer's pocket. It's not that big of a deal though. It's a dollar on a $30 item. It's decreasing your profit margin from 33% to 30%. Uh, 
maybe these tariffs go up to 25%. That's probably the absolute highest that they could ever go without totally sinking the Chinese and American economy. But um, it's still, it's 25% is not going to be a huge impact on things. You can weather this storm. Eventually, this trade spat is going to get resolved. Uh, rumor has it that the Republicans are digging in pretty deeply here, though, and that it's unlikely that a trade deal is going to be reached before the midterm elections in November, but probably in the next year or whatever, two years, it will get resolved. Somebody's going to cave and it'll get resolved. Just like NAFTA with China and Mexico, or China and Mexico, Canada and Mexico got resolved. Same thing's going to happen with China. It's going to get resolved. Um, importing beyond China, a lot of people now are asking about, hey, should I start looking at other countries to import from? Thing that you have to keep in mind, China is the factory of the world. China is not just so good at making products because they have a lot of people and a lot of cheap labor. They have all the factory equipment. They have all the machinery. They're a fairly educated population. Um, they have a lot of experience in manufacturing stuff. Uh, it just, it's not, you can't just simply replicate this by going to another cheap country. You can't just go to, you can't just all of a sudden go to Bangladesh and get the same items made that you're having made in China in Bangladesh. They don't have the expertise, the machinery, the, uh, the hardware to do it. So sure, you can start looking at other countries. Uh, the main regions that we see a lot of people looking for are obviously domestically, the USA and Canada, Vietnam, India, Taiwan and Korea to a lesser degree because they're higher wage countries, but they do do things well, like cheaper electronics. Um, now is not really the time, in my opinion, to start looking at other countries just to try to escape these tariffs. If it's part of your long-term sourcing strategy, okay, sure. Uh, just keep in mind, there's no other country as easy as China to import from. And none of these countries still, even with China wages increasing, even with tariffs increasing, China is still very competitive on costs. And it's pretty hard to beat them in terms of quality and cost. Okay, so on that note, where in China do you look for suppliers? Everyone knows about Alibaba. Uh, you either love Alibaba or you hate Alibaba. Alibaba is great and it's bad for a couple of reasons. It's great because it's very convenient. You can go on there and pretty much every factory in China that wants to sell abroad is on Alibaba. Uh, that doesn't mean they're all on there. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Um, Alibaba sucks though for one main reason. You find a great product in Alibaba. Let's say let's say Dave has this great product now. I'm I'm now selling these these great cups with coasters. You can go on to Alibaba right now and find my exact supplier pretty easily. And that's a problem. Uh, you get ripped off if you're having a, if a supplier in Alibaba is doing their job and marketing themselves really well, you're going to be ripped off a lot quicker on Amazon when you do find that great selling product. Uh, Mike, uh, my buddy, at, uh, my partner here at Econ Crew, he's going through one of these cases right now. He's actually having to basically sue somebody uh, because they found a supplier uh, on Alibaba, basically took all his molds and now are ripping off his products. Alibaba is still great. Um, just got to keep that in mind that uh, there are other sources out there and you're more likely to get knocked off quicker. The other thing you want to keep in mind with Alibaba is that Alibaba is a supplier directory. It's not a product directory. So if you go on Amazon, you're looking for a product, you just look on Amazon for the product that you're looking for. Alibaba is not quite that way. Amazon's really a, or Alibaba is really a directory of suppliers. And these suppliers don't have every single product that they've ever made on their Alibaba page. They have their most popular products on their Alibaba page, but they're not going to have all of their items. So what you have to do is you have to kind of look for suppliers that you think can make the product that you are looking for and ask them if they ever have made it. You just need to reach out to them, email them, say, hey, have you ever made, have you ever made an ATV bag? Um, using this ATV bag as an example, we were sourcing a, a, this bag that goes on the back of an ATV uh, quad vehicle. Really hard actually to find manufacturers who make this. Uh, so we didn't just look for ATV bag on Alibaba. What we did is we looked for companies making motorcycle bags. Very similar. They're making bags. They're making bags that go on vehicles. And we just reached out to them and said, hey, can you make, or not can you, have you ever made an ATV bag? And probably about 20 or 30% of them replied back, oh yeah, yeah, we made these in the past. And actually we have customers now. They just weren't advertising them on their Alibaba page. So you have to really specifically ask these companies, hey, have you made this or can you make it? Now, moving on from Alibaba, 
best place to find suppliers, in my opinion, by far is trade shows. Now we're kind of entering one of the biannual season, trade show seasons in China, uh, October and April. And why it's trade show season predominantly is because Canton Fair is happening right now. Now the Canton Fair is basically the largest trade show in the world. Uh, the Canton Fair, I look at it as more of a networking opportunity per se than necessarily a sourcing opportunity. The problem with the Canton Fair is that it's a very general trade show um, and to be successful in e-commerce, typically you, the riches are in the niches. So you need to find these niche items like an ATV bag. And most of these suppliers at uh, the Canton Fair are not going after these niches. They're going for very broad market appeal items. So again, what you need to do if you're walking around the Canton Fair is that you need to find companies that make similar items to what you're looking for and then just go up to their booth and ask them, hey, do you make XYZ item? Do you make this ATV bag? You really, you can't just hope that you find it on display that you really have to talk to these suppliers and figure out what they are making. What's their, what actually do they make? Other little track or hack with trade shows. If you can't go over to China and actually visit these trade shows, what you can do is number one, go to chinaexhibition.com. This is a listing of pretty much every trade show going on in China. Find a trade show, whether it's a Canton Fair or a more industry specific trade show for you. Go to that trade show's website and all of them are going to have a vendor directory. They're going to have a directory of all the vendors that are exhibiting there. Uh, just browse their websites. And when you find some companies that you're interested in, email them after the trade show has happened and tell them, hey, I met you at the Shanghai Boat Show and I'm interested in ABC product. And what they're gonna do is that some of these suppliers don't wanna just give out their pricing if they don't think that you're a real buyer. But when you email them right after a trade show has happened and you say that, hey, I found you through this trade show, what's going to happen is that they think that, oh, you must have attended the trade show. And so they're going to give you their best pricing. They're going to be a little bit more transparent with the information that they provide you simply because they thought that you attended the trade show. Uh, a couple other things, uh, places that you can look for suppliers, import records. If you don't know it in America, every time you import something into America, this is public information. Um, so you can find, you can look up any company pretty much in America. And if they're imported from China, you can see exactly what suppliers they're using, what products they're importing, when they've imported, and a bunch of other juicy information. The two main companies that provide this information are Import Genius and Panjiba. Uh, subscriptions cost around 100 bucks a month. Uh, definitely well worth it, especially if you're in a product development stage. You don't need to necessarily keep a subscription going on perpetually just because you only really need it when you're looking for products. Uh, but it's a great way you, you find a competitor that has a product that you're interested in, just search for their name and Import Genius, and it's going to tell you what suppliers they're using. Uh, I'm going to include a link. What you have to do if you don't want your information being disclosed is you have to email basically US Customs and say, hey, I want confidential vessel manifest information. What you do is you email them your company name and just say, hey, I want, I want my information private and they will not show your information in these import records. Uh, I'll put a link to the email address at the end. Definitely do that. Uh, if you're importing right now, do it ASAP. Uh, a couple other things, Yiwu, Yiwu is the largest wholesale market in the world. Yiwu is actually a city in Southern China. Uh, Yiwu is becoming a lot more popular nowadays. There's a lot of uh, different companies that are running sourcing trips to Yiwu. Uh, Yiwu is, think of it uh, basically like a 24 seven Canton fair. And basically every product you can imagine is in Yiwu. Uh, the problem with Yiwu is it's very low quality. I'm gonna use the word shitty products at Yiwu. Uh, if you're running like a dollar store or uh, you're from a developing country. The products in Yiwu are fantastic. For Amazon sellers, there's not a lot of great products at Yiwu. If you're in China, though, you're kind of in the Shanghai region, uh, take a trip down to Yiwu. Go down there for a day or a night. Uh, take a look at it. It's a pretty fascinating place, but probably not going to be a source of a lot of great products for you. And the other thing you can do is current suppliers. If you're looking for products, ask your suppliers that you're working with right now if they can help you source it. Most companies in China are happy to sell you anything. And what they're going to do is if I'm, if I have a company making this cup and I say, Hey, can you find me the coaster? They'll find me the, the company making the coaster and they'll add a 10% markup and we're all happy. They're probably getting lower prices because they have a relationship with that factory. 10% uh, that's not a whole lot uh, at a cost for me. 
That's just a win-win. Uh, so ask your current suppliers if you're having problems finding any products. Just simply ask your suppliers if they can help you source it. Okay, trading company or factory. Just touching on this really quickly. A trading company is basically a wholesaler or distributor in China. A factory is a factory that makes items. Uh, what everyone gets caught up, oh, I need to work with a factory only. I don't want to work with trading companies. Uh, what people fail to realize when it comes to manufacturing is that there is no factory in China that makes ev absolutely every component of a product that they're making. Uh, take a look at this camera. The factory that makes these cameras is not making every button on this. They're not making the lens cap. They're not making the circuit board that goes in the camera. They're specializing in one part of that camera. This cup comes in a box. That comp the company making the cup is not making the box. They're getting that from another company. Um, they are sort whether it's a factory or a trading company. The factory is still working with other factories to produce that product. Uh, the line, the distinction between a trading company and a factory is not that clear. Uh, so don't obsess with working with a factory or a trading company. If you find a trading company that's doing a great job and can get you products at a competitive rate, go with it. Sure. Who cares? Um, trading company is also going to have a lot better quality in general because the factory is going to have their quality control and then the trading company is going to have their quality control. So you get one more layer of quality control for your items. Um, I mean, there's advantages of working with a factory. Cost is not normally it. Uh, big advantage you get with factories, you have a little bit more direct communication with them. If you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to customize a product, it's easier to work directly with the factory because you don't, you're not playing this telephone tag where things get misconstrued. You're talking to the trading company, tell them you want to make this change to this product. And then that they relay that message to the factory and things get lost in communication. Uh, but trading company or factory doesn't really make a big deal of a difference. I, my previous company I sold, basically I sold it for nearly a million bucks and our main relationship was with the trading company. Okay, getting low MOQs. MOQs, minimum order quantities. Uh, everybody wants low MOQs. It's better, to, it's better to buy less items than more items, especially when you're testing an item. Uh, when you're first starting an item on Amazon, you don't know it's, if it's going to be a hit or not. You can do all the research you want, but until you actually start trying to sell that item, you don't know if it's gonna be a hit or not. Uh, so what you want to do is try to get as low initial order as possible to kind of test the waters out. Now, companies do not want to give low MOQs for a few different reasons. And you have to figure out what is the reason why the supplier wants me to order 5,000 units instead of 50 units. So first reason why suppliers don't want a low MOQ is that they don't have stock of the item or they actually have to make it just for you. So again, you're going back to this cup example. A lot of factories will keep these cups in stock and hey, when they get an order, they'll just ship them up. And in that case, they don't need to turn on the machines to produce it for you, they have it in stock. No big deal then having a low MOQ. But uh, conversely, a lot of factories actually need to turn on the machines when you wanna produce that. So they're not going to produce this 50 items for you. It has a certain cost to turn on that machine. Uh, what you can do in this case, if this is the reason why they don't wanna sell you a low MOQ order, you just have to, you have to tell them, I can wait until you turn on that machine and you can just co-produce my item with another customer. When you can do that, when you're a little bit more patient with your timing, uh, normally they'll agree to a low MOQ. The other reason why companies don't want low MOQs is it's simply too much work and money to deal with small orders. If you're only gonna order 200 bucks of this item, well, this factory has fixed costs. They have to deal with you. Uh, that's a pretty significant cost when you're asking a million questions through email. Uh, they have wire transfer fees. They have shipping fees. They have all these stupid. They have all these uh, stupid little fees that they have to pay in China, and not to mention the time cost. And the time cost is the most important thing. Now, what if it, that's the case? What you have to do is just simply be very low maintenance and be ready to pay immediately. Um, don't try to negotiate on price. Don't say, "Hey, can I give you thirty percent?" of a thousand bucks now and 70% later to say, I'll have to pay you a thousand bucks for this order right away. Um, just be very low maintenance and be ready to order right away. As much as a lot of factories and suppliers hate small orders, they like money even more. So if you're basically telling them, hey, I'm only gonna order hundred units right now, next order it's gonna be much bigger, but this first order, 
I need it to be small and just give me your bank information. I'll wire you the money right now. They have a hard time saying no. The other thing is that a lot of suppliers think that you need customization. And when I say customization, most of them think that you need to have custom packaging for this box. And again, like I mentioned, these factories aren't producing their boxes themselves. They're having to order them from a box factory. Every box factory in the world pretty much has an MOQ of 500 pieces for a custom full color box. So that's why you're going to see a lot of times that items typically have an MOQ of 500 pieces. So what you have to do in your initial emails is make it clear that you don't need custom packaging. You can just, they can just ship it in a plain white box. Um, or if they have a non-branded box, so um, again, just going back to the stupid cup example, if they have an unbranded box, just a nice color box that has a picture of a cup on it, but it doesn't have any branding on it, so any uh, logos or anything, you can say, hey, just ship it in that. Ship it in a non-branded box. We don't need our own custom box. Make it clear to them, and then a lot of times you remove that barrier of them having to order boxes. And again, they'll be more likely to work with you on a smaller order. The silver bullet though to get low MOQs is on a trial order. If you only want to order 20 cups, every supplier, they're going to agree to send you a sample of one item because they figure, okay, you need to see it. This is your silver bullet, the sample order or a trial order. Your very first order that you make with a supplier, they're going to agree to pretty much any amount that you want to order. And what a lot of people do is they'll order just one of these cups, they'll get a sample, they'll look it over and say, oh, okay, well, that's pretty good and then they'll make a bigger order. And on that second order, now they say, no, you had your sample order, now you need to order the MOQ. Well, ordering one item doesn't really do much. First off, supplier's gonna send you their quote unquote golden sample, the very best product that they have. Um, and you can't really test sell one item on Amazon. If you put it on Amazon and you sell one, it doesn't really mean uh, that you're gonna sell a million next year. Uh, but if you can get 50 items or 20 items, that's a pretty fair sample size. So that's what I always do when I'm ordering a product for the first time. I say, hey, can you send me one carton of products? And normally that's 20 to 50 products. I say, hey, can you send me one carton of products uh, just for I can test it and sample it and uh, just kind of review it. Normally they're going to say, sure, no problem. And they'll send you one carton of products. Then I can put those products on Amazon. I have 20 products now, put them on Amazon. If I sell 20 items in a day, well, shit, I, gotta, I probably have a home run product and no problem, I can order 500 units. If I sell 20 products in a week, yeah, sure, I probably still, I've got a pretty good product. I can, um, I can order, I can commit to an MOQ. Now, if I have 20 products and after two months, I haven't sold any, well, I'm sure glad that I found out with 20 products, this is a loser product and I don't have to place an order for $10,000 for a whole container of cups. I'd much rather find that out in 20 items than uh, a huge order. So. Just use this very first order to your example uh, to your advantage. Don't ask for one sample. Ask for a carton of samples. Then you can test it out on Amazon or wherever you're trying to sell them. Uh, negotiation strategy. Again, you're not at a disadvantage to these Chinese sellers. You can negotiate great prices and other advantages. Uh, the thing that the thing that a lot of people get caught up on is to get ca caught up on negotiating price. Well, price is kind of the last thing that you should think about. Prices in China right now, factories are pretty pretty stable. There's not necessarily a lot of flexibility in them. Uh, if you can get a 10% discount, that's huge normally. What people overlook are, is other things that you can negotiate. So kind of my kind of pecking order for things that I try to negotiate with my suppliers. First order, I try to negotiate that MOQ down. Uh, normally if the supplier quotes you 500 units, their real MOQ is 50% of that, 250 units. Uh, sometimes a lot lower. Uh, so that's always the first item that I'm trying to negotiate. Uh, second order is that that's when I'm getting back all those sample fees and everything that I paid on that first order. So when you order, uh, when you order a bunch of samples or a trial order, normally the supplier is going to tell you, you know what, you pay for these samples right now and the shipping fees to you. The next time you make your order, we'll give you that money back. And it's true, they'll, they will do that, but they won't give you that money back if you don't ask. <laughs> you have to make sure that you ask them to get that money back. Uh, third order, I'm trying to get better freight terms. So if they're quoting me EXW, that basically means that I have to pay, uh, I have to pay for all the freight from their factory to the port of China uh, instead of FOB, which means that I don't pay for that freight, that domestic freight. 
uh, I'm trying to negotiate better freight terms. And these are called INCO terms in importing language. Uh, thing that you just want to be aware of is that FOB is always going to be cheaper than EXW. Uh, but a lot of times on, as you're a small, as you're making small orders, they're going to want you to order EXW. They're going to have EXW freight terms instead of FOB. So try to negotiate on that. Um, I'm also trying to negotiate better deposit terms. Uh, more and more suppliers are asking for 100% deposit. I almost never do that. But if for some reason you're stuck in that, uh, that by your third order, you should definitely be on uh, at least what they call 3070 payment terms. That means that you pay 37, 30% when you make the order and you pay the 70% uh, when you, when you, when the products are actually done and have been shipped on the boat. Uh, CIF, uh, Jerry's asking in the chat box, CIF is even more favorable than FOB. That basically means that the supplier is paying for all the costs from China to whatever port it is in America that they're going to normally Long Beach or Seattle. Uh, the fourth order, I'm asking for packaging. So I have all these custom boxes that I'm paying 50 cents a box for. I'm going to say to my supplier, hey, why don't you pay for these packaging uh, costs? Because we're ordering a lot of items now. Fifth order, now I'm asking them to actually pay for freight over to America. I'll say, hey, I'm importing now five containers a year. Next year, I'm gonna do 10 containers. Uh, if you can pay for some of that cost of freight, we'll significantly increase our order volume. And a lot of times they'll agree to actually pay for all of the cost of freight to, to America or Canada or wherever it is that you're going. Uh, if they're kind of resistant to that, sometimes they'll agree to split the cost of freight with you. Uh, if you're familiar with ordering domestically in America or Canada, you know that freight terms are fairly common. Uh, you, you order $5,000, you get free freight. Uh, we all do it in e-commerce. We all have free shipping. It's the same thing with factories. They uh, are much more prone to negotiate freight costs than they are product costs for whatever reasons. And finally, on the last order, I'm trying to get credit from my suppliers. I don't want to pay them anything until I have the products and I'm actually selling them on Amazon. Uh, at the very minimum, I'm trying to go for paying them 50% uh, when the products ship, and I'll pay them 50% 60 days later or so. And that really helps your cash flow. Uh, Chinese factories and suppliers, they are, uh, compared to a lot of countries, they're okay with credit. Uh, they're happy to give you credit terms if they have trust with you. And that trust does take quite a few orders to build. I find it takes about a year and a half, two, hour, two years to build that you can start asking for credit. Uh, but once they trust you, they're more often than not happy to give you credit. Um, I'm just gonna go over now quickly to wrap things up, some hacks for getting your items from China to Amazon. So there's two ways that you can get your items from China to Amazon. Uh, the first way to do it is to basically have a middleman or a quote unquote 3PL in the middle. 3PL is just a warehouse that's going to receive your goods, break them down and ship them on Amazon. Uh, the advantages to doing it that way, opposed to going directly into Amazon, if you go to a 3PL, uh, it's, it has very small storage costs compared to Amazon. People don't realize how expensive Amazon storage is, and not just when you get slapped with long-term storage fees, not just during the peak season, which we have just entered. Uh, overall, even during non-peak times, their storage rates are about three times higher than your average 3PL. Also with the 3PL, you can use partner carriers. You can use Amazon partner carriers to get your items into Amazon, uh, which is very cheap. Multiple fulfillment centers isn't a problem with the 3PL. If you have uh, 10 pallets and Amazon's asking you to send three to Indiana, three to Arizona, and four to California, well, they can break that up, no problem. Now, the main problems with the 3PL is it's more money. Uh, aside from the storage costs, having the 3PL receive those products, uh, label them, split them up, that has a cost. Uh, for a container, you're looking at probably around a thousand bucks to have for all those different fees that you're paying. Amazon doesn't pay any fees to receive your items or they don't charge you any fees to receive your items. Um, they don't, uh, they don't charge you uh, um, labeling fees or any, or anything like that. A 3PL is going to charge you that. Uh, and Amazon does charge you labeling fees, but uh, other additional labels that you might need that 3PL would apply, uh, you're obviously not going to be charged for. And also with the 3PL, you just have more handling of your products. It's, a, it's always better to have a sealed container going into Amazon where you're not having UPS and FedEx handle your products. And we've all seen what a UPS and FedEx delivery man can do to a product. Uh, 
they're manhandling your products. You don't want that happening. It's going to lead to more damage uh, for your products. So it's better if you can avoid that. Now going to Amazon, uh, the advantages and disadvantages to going directly to Amazon, you don't have any receiving costs. You have smaller overland freight costs. So if you can go directly from China into a warehouse, uh, what they call Ontario 8 in Long Beach, California, uh, you're basically saving on all overland freight costs. Now the problem is, I'm going to get to this, is that Amazon a lot of times is going to ask you to ship to multiple fulfillment centers. So if you have a container going from China to Amazon, often Amazon is not going to ask you to ship that container to one fulfillment center. They're going to ask you to divide it into three different shipments and ship it to three different uh, fulfillment centers throughout the U.S. So that's an issue. I'm going to talk about it here in a second. Uh, the other thing with Amazon is that they have higher storage costs. Uh, and especially right now from October to December, those storage costs are about two and a half times higher than normal. And if you get term, hit with long-term storage fees, six months or above, uh, you are absolutely being raped in terms of storage fees. And it's basically going to render any profit that you have uh, unprofitable. So getting to this shipping to one warehouse with Amazon uh, point. So like I mentioned, if you're an Amazon seller right now, you know that Amazon typically is trying to split your shipments into multiple uh, fulfillment centers. So the old hack, if you want to ship your products directly to one fulfillment center is you make your shipment on Amazon. Let's pretend again, I'm shipping a thousand of these cups into Amazon. Amazon says, well, you need to ship 500 of them to California and 500 of them to Indiana. Well, I don't want, I can't ship the ship. I can't split the shipment in China. So what I do is I would make a shipment within Amazon. And instead of Sam shipping a thousand cups, I would say I'm shipping 2000 cups. Uh, now what happens is Amazon's going to ask me to send a thousand to California and a thousand to Indiana. I ship a thousand immediately into California. And the next time I reorder in four or five months, I simply ship the remaining 1000 into Indiana. That was the old hack for how you could kind of game Amazon a little bit. Uh, as of August 31st, Amazon changed this, uh, this hack. They kind of got rid of it. So what they say now is that if you create a shipment in China you or in Amazon and it's going to multiple fulfillment centers, you have to ship to all those fulfillment centers within 30 days. So they've kind of caught on to this hack. Um, they're, they're fairly lenient with that 30 day period. You can ship a month or two after, no problem. Uh, anything after that, they are sending out warning letters to people. So how can you, aside from using this hack, what, how else can you get around shipping to multiple fulfillment centers or FCs? First thing absolutely you have to do is you have to avoid mixing oversized items, standard size items and items that need prep and prep normally means labeling or putting things in a poly bag or applying suffocation stickers. When you do this, oversized items, standard size items, and items needing prep, they all go to different warehouses absolutely 100% of the time. So when, when I'm doing my inventory planning now, I always have, I have three periods throughout the year where I'm shipping items. I sh we order items from China basically every four months. And every four months, so we have a standard size container that we ship and an oversized container. Standard size items typically go to one warehouse. Oversized items, they're more frequently split, and that's a problem. But the point is that we do not ever put oversized items and standard size items in the same container, in the same LCL shipment, in any of the same shipments. It's just going to immediately increase the number of warehouses that you have to ship to. Like I mentioned, if your items are oversized. Oversized is anything over 18 inches. You are probably going to have to ship to multiple fulfillment centers is not a real good way around this. Now, if you're shipping standard size items like this cup, uh, Amazon is pretty good now with shipping, asking you to only ship to one warehouse. Now, if you're shipping from China to America, your first port is almost certainly going to be Long Beach, California. And you know what? If you're shipping to Long Beach, California, just outside of Los Angeles, you probably want to go to a warehouse that's really close to Los Angeles so you can get your shipments checked in quickly. And so you don't have a lot of extra freight costs going from the port to the warehouse. So here's a little hack that still works very effectively right now. In your ship from address, when you're creating your Amazon shipment, 
uh, put down the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air's house, 251 North Bristol Avenue, Los Angeles, California, 90049. Put that as your ship from address. And what will happen is that Amazon is more often than not going to have you shipping to what they call Ontario 8, uh, which is their fulfillment center just outside of Los Angeles. And this is totally TOS compliant. Uh, your ship from address, uh, people always ask if you're shipping direct from China, what, what do I put here? Do I put my factory? Do I put my house? It doesn't really matter what you put because you're not using a partner carrier. Amazon doesn't get, care who you put there uh, because you don't have a partner carrier. So just put that address if you're shipping directly from um, uh, China to Amazon. Uh, a few other shipping hacks before we wrap up here. Uh, try to combine shipments from multiple suppliers into one shipment. So if you have three suppliers that you're working with, simply have two of those suppliers ship to one of your supplier's factory, combine them all into one shipment. Again, there's high fixed cost uh, for each shipment. If you can consolidate it into one shipment, you save a lot of money. Use the de minimis threshold to your advantage. America is absolutely crazy and they have an $800 de minimis threshold, which means anything under $800, you do not pay taxes, duties, uh, any types of brokerage on. So if you have a shipment of cups and you ship $799 of them, you're not going to pay any tariffs, whether they're the new Trump tariffs or the existing tariffs. Get your supplier to do all of your labeling for you. Don't have Amazon do it. Don't have a 3PL do it. Just have your supplier do it. Normally they'll do it for free. Uh, be pushing somehow to get to a 20 foot full container of products. So it sounds like a lot of products, but full containers are way cheaper than any other shipping service that you can have. Whether it's LCL, that's basically a less than a container load, air shipping, uh, any of the other shipping services you can get. A container is pretty much your maximum efficiency. That's going to be your most cost effective way of shipping ever. So always be trying to push to get to a 20 foot container. Um, Obviously, your first order is not going to be that big, but in the long run, try to get there because you're going to save a lot of money on shipping. Uh, when it comes to containers, the other thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, a container can fit basically 30 cubic meters. That's just a way of uh, measuring uh, the dimensions of the container. More often than not, it's cheaper to actually ship a container half full than it is to ship it with LCL. And LCL is basically you co-mingle your inventory with somebody else's in a container. Uh, it's cheaper to ship a half full container. It sounds crazy, but it's true. Um, the other thing, when you're shipping a container, opposed to using what they call LCL, you're going to get your goods quicker because what happens is that container is yours. You can just go pick it up from the port and you can deliver it to Amazon right away. If you're using LCL, it has to be picked up from the port. It has to go to this other warehouse. They have to de-stuff it. And then they have to give you a shout about a week later and say, hey, your shipment's ready to be picked up along with the other people who have had their items co-mingled with you. And it adds about a one to two week turnaround cycle uh, for your shipment. So it's better to ship a half full container uh, opposed to co-mingling your items through LCL. Um, and a little sales pitch here at the end for everybody. Uh, so Ecom Crew Premium, this is our private members area of Ecom Crew. Uh, myself and Mike, we've spent a lot of time developing this. Uh, there's a couple highlights of Ecom Crew Premium. I'll just kind of flip over to the screen now to talk about it here for a second. And don't worry, guys, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but it's uh, we're pretty proud of what we've created here at Ecom Crew Premium. The big thing that you'll get access to when you join Premium is that you get uh, access to a garage of courses. So our courses that we have are, are full length courses. Uh, we've spent easily a hundred hours plus developing each course. The four courses are importing from China like a pro, which obviously uh, is a very good extension of what we talked about in this webinar. Our start a seven figure product brand course. So all about how to find products, develop them, uh, make a brand, don't just import disparate products, which aren't related at all, actually how to build a product brand. Uh, our Amazon launch strategy, how to get a product when you've actually got them now from China, how to get them to the bestseller uh, badge on Amazon. That's kind of our goal with every new product that we launch. We want them to have that new seller, best, best seller, new bestseller badge. Uh, so we talk about our whole launch strategy, uh, focusing on external traffic into Amazon. And our latest one that we have is our messenger course, uh, our Facebook messenger course, which is a huge trend right now in e-commerce. Um, this is definitely the way that e-commerce is going right now is messenger 
uh, in China, since that we're on the topic of China, WeChat is absolutely the, the platform of commerce in China. It's gonna happen eventually with Facebook Messenger. We're not there yet, we're getting there. You're better to get ahead uh, and learn the stuff while you can. So here's one of the, here's Facebook Messenger course. Uh, each course is about anywhere from 10 to 20 hours in instruction um, and pretty high quality stuff if I don't say so myself. The other thing that you get access to is bi-weekly webinars. So every two weeks we do uh, two types of webinars. We do a Q&A with all of our members. So you can come into our webinar. Normally it's on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. at the exact same time this webinar is on. And you can ask any questions that you want of myself or Mike. Uh, the other one we do is we also, every month, we have an expert come in and talk about some, basically teach some type of topic. Now, it could be me or my, uh, myself or Mike teaching that topic. Uh, it could be product packaging or different launch strategies we're using. Uh, but we're also having now other expert, outside experts come in and basically teach a topic uh, live to our members. So we have Dave Huss coming in this month, basically talking about uh, how to launch a Facebook community and do it organically. Uh, a couple months from now, we have Joe Valley from Quiet Light Brokerage coming in, talking about selling a business and what to think about when you need to sell your business or if you want to buy one. And our last kind of big thing with our uh, with our Ecom Crew Premium is our Facebook group. It's a private members only area. Uh, we have over 100 members right now. And very active every day. We have a few different posts. Uh, Sometimes it's private information, so I'm not going to dive too much into it just because we try to keep uh, all the information in Econ Crew Premium, our Facebook group, uh, we try to keep it confidential in case people are sharing product ideas and different private business information. But it's a nice, a nicely active group. I think it's uh, definitely one of the more productive Facebook communities out there for sellers and importers. Um, and once you join Econ Crew Premium, you get access to all of those things. And Ecom Crew Premium, it starts, we do it on a monthly plan. Uh, plans start at $79 a month if you prepay for the year, 159 bucks if you go month to month. Uh, and you get immediate access to everything as part of Ecom Crew Premium. You get all the courses, you get Facebook community, you get the webinars. Uh, if you are so inclined, you can join Ecom Crew Premium, go download all our courses and quit and never come back. Uh, most members stick around for basically indefinitely though because of that kind of ongoing training and community that we've tried to build. So that kind of wraps up things. Let's see, I see the chat bar blinking here. Just make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, the links here at the bottom, again, we will email out this presentation to everybody at the end, uh, including the big one is obviously the Econ Crew uh, premium link that you get. Uh, like I mentioned, you get access for 79 bucks a month. Uh, also the email address where you should send to US Customs to say, hey, don't share my information with uh, all these all these other Amazon sellers about my shipments that I'm importing from China. Uh, so we'll email that out to everybody here uh, uh, probably later today or at the latest in the morning. Okay, let's tackle the Q&A. Let's see what we have. Joe asks, any chance, Joe Moore, good to see you again, buddy. Uh, any chance of Canada following the USA on these duties? So the funny thing with these duties, uh, the tariffs that China's, or not China, that America's implementing, um, why America has them is that whether you love or you hate Trump, uh, America has been getting screwed <laughs> in terms of trade internationally for quite a long time. Uh, it's part of the reason why, why, Canada and the US and Mexico renegotiated NAFTA. It, it, from America's perspective, a lot of components are unfair. Um, and especially with IP, China stealing a lot of IP from America. Uh, Trump and the Republicans are not trying to get back manufacturing in America. That's not really their goal. Um, they realize that nobody's ever gonna be making sneakers in America ever again. What they're trying to do is to solve some other trade disputes that they have going on. Uh, and how this relates to Canada, um, Canada doesn't really have any beef with these things. They're not getting abused quite as hard, quite as uh, radically as America is. So, you know, Canada's almost no chance that they're ever going to impose these. 
So Rob asks, when doing your test order technique, what degree of effort do you put into photos, copy, launch, et cetera, if it sells, but then you're out of stock, you create a new listing for the final order so, you, so that you have consistent sales velocity. So when you're launching the product, I mean, you, you're not going to have a perfect listing um, just because you're not going to have great photos at the time. You probably need a photographer to get those done, uh, whether it's in China or domestically. Uh, the copy, yeah, you can spend time on that. There's no reason why you shouldn't have perfect copy. Um, you're probably not going to spend a ton of money sending external traffic to the listing. So typically what I'm doing, I'm targeting fairly low demand products, things that are selling ten to $20,000 a month. And that's, in my eyes, fairly low demand. Uh, I don't have a problem where a product goes out of stock and it's never able to regain the, the rankings. Where you fall in that problem where you run out of stock is if you have a really high demand product. If you have hundreds of competitors, you run out of stock, it takes a long time to go from ranking 300 all the way back up to the first page. If you have a product though that has 30 or 40 competitors, it doesn't take all that long to regain your rankings slowly after being out of stock back up to the first page. Um, so normally I'm just running with the same product listing uh, during a trial technique and then once I actually officially launch the product. Uh, with that being said, I have had to relaunch products um, just because we'll order the trial order and then we'll radically change the product. And so we simply relaunch on a new SKU, on a new UPC, on a new ASIN, um, just because the product is totally different. Or because we did a trial, a trial we did a trial run uh, with the trial products, and the products weren't up to snub, and we had to revise quality, and the reviews weren't great, so we'll just relaunch it on a new UPC. Um, so you can do it either one of both ways. If you have a listing though, it gets great reviews, and uh, during the trial order, and you have some great sales velocity, I would keep that same listing. We create a new listing. Again, you you can be pretty certain that the new listing is going to have the same success that the previous listing had. Uh, there's no reason that it shouldn't. It's the same product, uh, hopefully just a little bit better. Sorry guys, just going through here. Is the supplier doing the labeling or is Amazon? Uh, for our case, Amazon or the supplier is doing almost all the labeling. So as you know, you're going to have a UPC, you're going to have a carton label. And if you're shipping LCL, you're going to need pallet labels on the items. So what we do, yes, we have the UPC is applied to all of our products in China. Uh, we have all the carton labels applied uh, in China. In terms of the pallet labels, um, again, just kind of a side note that a lot of people don't realize when you ship LCL from China, people think that they're putting it on a pallet and stuffing it into a container container. They don't actually do that. What they do is they just take all your boxes and they shove them into a container with everybody else's boxes. Um, so what happens is if they, you're then shipping those pallets into Amazon, once they get to America, you actually need to pay your 3PL or somebody else to repalletize your items. You're better off to request palletization in China. And when that happens, your supplier needs to apply pallet labels. When you're requesting your supplier to palletize the items for an LCL shipment, you need to make sure that they have that they meet the international export requirements for those pallets. I think it's called AC, IC66 pallets or something. Uh, they're going to charge you 20 bucks a pallet, but it's going to work out cheaper than if you have it done in America. And yes, like I mentioned, they're doing all the labeling. Otherwise, you're going to pay a 3PL or Amazon to do it for you. Do you need to register a company to import from China? In America, to import into America, you can apply for what they call a non-resident importer ID. Uh, if you're a resident of America, uh, you can import you can import into China, into America under your own personal name. Um, in terms of actually selling your products, though, that's a whole different deal. You do need a company to actually sell those products. In America, though, uh, if you're not a resident of America, you can apply for what they call a non-import, non-resident importer ID. Uh, any customs broker will set you up with that either for free or for about a hundred bucks. And that allows you to basically import in China or import into America, whether or not you have a company in America or not. Uh, 
Uh, so Jerry asks, if I request that my importing info be private, will it not be accessible by Import Genius? Yes, that's the point. Um, so once you once you email that email address, you have to give them your company name. I think your address. It will not be accessible by Import Genius. So most countries in the world don't actually expose your importing information, but America has some pretty crazy freedom of information laws. And so they make all that information available to the public. Uh, so yeah, if you're, especially if you're doing any type of volume, you don't want people creeping on you, email that address right as soon as you get off this call. Actually, the first thing you should do is go by Econ Crew Premium. And then once you're done that, uh, go email that email address and basically just tell them, don't, do not disclose my, manif my vessel manifest information. And then you'll stay completely private. Let's see here. Yeah. Tony asks, how much should I expect to spend getting started? Uh, I would, again, it, you can you can get started with any amount of money that you want making an order from China, especially if you're ordering off AliExpress. You can make a $200 order for 200 different widget spinners uh, if you want. I think a more reasonable expectation for how much money that you should be spending on your first order is $2,500 to $5,000. Um, most suppliers, they tend to be around a $5,000 MOQ. You know, with those MOQs, when they say $5,000, again, this is another little way that you can uh, negotiate that MOQ down. Uh, they might have a $5,000 minimum order uh, value amount. And they won't tell you that, but that's the number that they have in their head. They say, okay, Dave needs to order $5,000 worth of products. You can mix and match products though. If that company is selling multiple different items. You can say, okay, well, give me a thousand of this item and 2000 of this item and 2000 of this item. You hit your $5,000 threshold and then you kind of have more eggs and more baskets and it diversifies you, uh, diversifies your product line and basically allows you to order less products per product. And somebody asked, do you handle the duties once your items are in the US or do you delegate to a company? Uh, yeah, you can do it yourself. Again, a lot of people don't realize that, but you can do it yourself. If you have not cried in a while though, uh, and you wanna do customs and duties yourself, uh, be prepared to cry it is the most painful experience trying to clear customs on your own. So you should use, uh, you should definitely use a customs broker. The ones that we recommend is PCBUSA.com. If you mention that uh, you're an Econ Crew listener or a reader, uh, they will give you some preferred rates. We don't get a commission or anything for this, but um, we've kind of negotiated with them just because we have a lot of people that we refer and uh, it's probably one of the number one requests that we get is for a customs broker or a freight forwarder. Pacific customs broker is both of those things. So just email them and mention that you're an econ crew listener and you'll get some pretty nice rates. Okay. Chris asks, I want to request samples, one each of 10 different products, which range in price from 150 to 350. Uh, I'm willing to pay for them, but don't know if the factory is gonna give them to me for free. How should I approach this question with them? Uh, no, they will almost certainly not give them to you for free. Used to be back in the day, 10 years ago when I first got started, they would give you samples for free. If you're just simply ordering through the internet, almost never are they going to give you the samples for free. In fact, a lot of times what they're going to do now is they're actually gonna charge you a surcharge uh, for ordering a small amount of items. So it might be a $2 item uh, regularly if you order a thousand of them, but if you're only gonna order 10 or 20, they're gonna charge you $4. Uh, just because now with the internet and uh, with a lot more interest in, in importing, they're getting a lot of these requests for small orders um, and they simply just can't afford, uh, they don't have enough supply to meet that demand. They don't have enough manpower to deal with all those requests, so they have to charge more money for them. Uh, so asking them for free, probably you're not going to get them for free. The only time it works, if you go to a trade show in China and you actually meet face-to-face -face with somebody and they say, oh, okay, well, Dave, he looks credible and he's probably a real business and he's going to do us, a, he's going to make us a lot of money in the long run. Uh, I've had them, I've had them send me five, $500 in items free of charge, including shipping. That's only after I met them face-to-face -face and we have that trust. Simply ordering online through Alibaba, it's not, uh, they're almost never going to agree to send them to you for free. OK. 
Okay, so I'll give it another minute just to kind of see if anybody else has any questions. Uh, before we wrap up here, let me think of anything, any other tips I can give you. Um, one other thing to keep in mind, we are October 10th right now, if you're considering importing from China. Chinese New Year is on February 6th, and you might have heard of this little holiday called Chinese New Year. Chinese New Year happens on February 6th. Chinese New Year is officially a one-week holiday. Unofficially, it's about six weeks, and it starts about three weeks prior to February 6th, and it extends for about three weeks after February 6th. Uh, give, me, give me a little story. We were living in Xiamen, China last year during Chinese New Year. We thought, okay, well, everything's gonna be closed down for a week, we can, we can deal with that. Literally every supermarket near us was closed down for three weeks, supermarkets. We had to travel almost an hour uh, on a bus because I, I couldn't drive in China, uh, almost an hour just to find a supermarket that had uh, any type of selection at all. Uh, China absolutely becomes a ghost town around Chinese New Year. Why does that matter for you? If you want to import from China, you need to be getting your orders in pretty much no later than November, the middle of November. Uh, you might find some suppliers willing to work with you up until the end of November. Most suppliers are going to take about 30 to 40 days to produce an item. Um, and so you need to have your orders in by the beginning of November. Maybe the, maybe the middle of November uh, can suffice. Uh, but you cannot place orders. If you want to place any orders in December, your, the suppliers will be glad to take your orders, but you're probably not going to get them until March or April of that uh, next year. So get your orders in as soon as you can right now. Uh, it is Chinese New Year time, and it sounds crazy that you have to be placing orders basically five months before Chinese New Year happens, but you do. Otherwise, you're going to end up, like I've ended up many, many times where you're out of stock for months on end simply because you don't realize how crazy of a holiday Chinese New Year is. Okay, guys, I think that's all the questions that we have. So like I mentioned, we will send out a, the slides for this webinar uh, sometime later today um, or early tomorrow morning. And I think that's all. We'll have another webinar coming up next month. We'll send out email details about that uh, here shortly as well. So thank you guys for attending and happy selling.